good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see so many friendly faces. Um, there are many dimensions to the, to the Syrian crisis, um, and I'll focus my presentation today on how the Syrian uprising is, is viewed from the perspective of the Gulf states. Um, since this is, in a way, the least studied aspect and the least understood aspect, uh, contrary to you know, the perspective from Lebanon or Israel or Turkey or Iraq, um, but it's also the one that's gaining uh, uh, importance by, by the segment, uh, judging uh, the events in, in the past few days. Um, the Gulf states' interest and, and, uh, and uh, policy towards Syria is a subject of uh, much speculation and, and fantasy, to be, to be honest. Um, and so it's important to understand the motivation, the history, the, the activities, and the limits to, uh, um, uh, to the influence of the Gulf states uh, to, towards Syria, because they're going to be key in, uh, they've already been key in, in uh, the recent diplomacy uh, uh, on Syria, but they're going to play a, a more prominent role, I, I assume, in, in coming months. Um, but just as with Iran, it's important to keep in mind that Gulf views on Syria differ, and they're not completely aligned, and, and we'll get back, I'll get back to that in, in a second. Even though uh, the differences, it, it, the differences is uh, less sharp than, than uh, when it comes to Iran. Um, so how does uh, the Syrian uprising uh, look uh, from a Gulf perspective? Well, um, undeniably, it's a moment of opportunity. Um, now, before I, 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 I explain why it's an, an opportunity for the Gulf states, I, I want to note a very important aspect, um, a, a very important lens through which the Gulf states look at, look at Syria, and that's uh, the undeniable sectarian dimension, uh, the sectarian narrative that has taken hold in the Gulf states when it comes to the Syrian uprising. Um, obviously, you know, the Gulf states being uh, six, uh, Sunni monarchies, with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia being uh, the champion of, of Sunni Islam, uh, that's not uh, very surprising. But it's important to understand that the media war that has been waged, in a way, against the Assad regime, whether it's a legitimate or illegitimate one, is beyond the point. That media war is very much driven by those sentiments. Now, um, those of you who watch, uh, uh, those of us uh, who watch uh, Arabic satellite networks, uh, will look at Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya. Um, there is an element of sectarianism in their own coverage, um, but I would urge you to look at other outlets uh, like Resell Television, which uh, I watch Resell so you don't have to. Um, it's a rabid sectarian uh, Sunni uh, uh, station that uh, is uh, uh, broadcast uh, out of uh, Saudi and, and I think they have programs in, in Bahrain and other places. And it has played a key role in sectarian mobilization and sectarian awareness in, in the Gulf. Uh, Sheikh Annan al awur who has become uh, the equivalent of Salabi in, uh, in Libya, um, is now a very prominent figure in, in Syria because he has been put forward. On this. I'll get back to this in, in a second, um, in the media war. But on, on the issue of sectarianism, um, I just want to quote something that I, I came across in Charles Assad a few months ago by Dr. Raed al Karni, a, a senior Saudi cleric. And this is what he wrote uh, back, in, um, back in August. I call upon the Saudi Council of Senior Scholars, the World Association of Muslim Scholars, the, uh, the Al-Azhar University, the Muslim World League, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, and other prominent Islamic organizations, as well as prominent Muslim figures and scholars and so on, and indeed anyone who possesses faith, a conscious fear of God, and concern for Islam, to rise up and confront the Syrian regime, which is an enemy of Islam and Arabism. And that kind of language um, has uh, really, uh, um, I, I won't say dominate, but has become more prominent in the Gulf discussion on, on Syria. That said, there it is also a strategic opportunity for the Gulf states. Um, obviously, it's about checking and even reversing Iran's inroads in, in, in the Levant. And that's how uh, the discussion in Majlis's and Diwaniyas around the region um, um, takes place. Um, this is an opportunity to reverse the loss of Iraq by gaining Syria. Um, these are not simply my interpretation. These are words that are put pretty straightforwardly in, in, in those terms um, in the region. Now, there is an interesting uh, discussion there whether um, the, the price that the Gulf states were willing to pay to Syria pre-uprising uh, to obtain a shift away from Iran um, is, is greater uh, than the one the Gulf states have to pay today 
to actually take down the, uh, the Assad regime. That's one aspect of the discussion that I found very interesting, looking back and saying, perhaps we could have induced him more. Um, that's assuming he could have been induced. But this, this is another element of, of the discussion happening in the region. It's also an opportunity, uh, the Syrian uprising is also an opportunity because um, the Gulf states have been very keen on taking away the resistance card against Israel from Syria. Uh, the Gulf states, especially since the 2006 war, have felt that uh, Syria was setting the terms of the confrontation with the, the, uh, uh, towards Israel. And uh, uh, Syria emerged from that war as having sided with the victor, was setting the terms and so on. And the Gulf states really resented that, uh, really resented the, the rapprochement between uh, Palestinian groups and Syria and so on. And, and this is a, a moment of opportunity in the way. We'll see where Hamas goes, whether Hamas really uh, looks for new sponsors, that perhaps in Qatar or other places. But this is very much uh, something on people's mind. Um, there is a, another aspect here, uh, which is the, the personal dimension. And this is something um, that is not highlighted enough. Um, Syrian insults against uh, Gulf rulers um, uh, have not been forgotten in the region. Um, you know, but I remember uh, Bashar al-Assad in 2006 talking about uh, you know, Gulf leaders be, being half men. Um, just the current press rhetoric, uh, just today Walid Mahalim talking about how the Gulf station you know, could go to the moon and you know, uh, other flowery language. It's taken very, uh, uh, very personally by a number of, of uh, rulers and, and leaders in the region. And even in uh, Bashar al-Assad's most recent speech, um, he was pretty direct, uh, derogatory. Uh, demean he had a, a very demeaning, uh, 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 demeaning words towards uh, towards the Gulf states. How they weren't real states, and it's not because you build towers that you become uh, uh, more credible actors, and and so on. And this is very resented in, in the region. Um, before I, I, I go more in detail here, I am. Um, I think it's important to understand the context in which this Gulf escalation against Syria is, is taking place. Um, and here I'm, I'm going to just talk about the context. We have to remember where we were just before the, the Syrian uprising. Um, the Qatari relations with Syria were very strong. Um, you know, there was no sense in February or March that there was a, you know, a, a breakdown in, in relations uh, uh, coming. Um, there was a Saudi Syrian rapprochement in Lebanon um, in July 2010 with uh, Bashar al Assad and uh, King Abdullah of uh, Saudi Arabia visited uh, Beirut together. Um, and there was also discussion about the Haredi Tribunal and how to mitigate its effects and so on. And the uh, famous uh, SS uh, formula for Lebanon, the Syria Saudi formula. So there was a sense of rapprochement. Um, but the Syrian uprising also coincided with the Libyan uprising and the start of uh, NATO operations in, in Libya. But more importantly was the Bahaini uprising. Um, the Gulf official dome was initially preoccupied by these two crises more than the Syria one. And, uh, and there was a sentiment, and there was a feeling in the Gulf that of all those leaders, you know, Bashar could sustain it. I mean, you know, that, that there was no real urgency to this crisis. And it did. Um, and so the Gulf states were uh, as surprised as everyone else when uh, the, the, the uprising really picked up steam. Um, and I think the Bahaini uprising is, is, is a key uh, um, uh, moment here. Uh, the entry of GCC troops into Bahrain uh, was condemned by Iran, but not by Syria. Was, there was a, a single <coughs> statement by, uh, um, uh, by Syria condemning or you know, uh, uh, this, the, this development. Um, and in a way, this uh, bought Syria some uh, goodwill in, in the Gulf. Um, he kept the rhetoric uh, very low and so on. And the Bahaini, the UAE foreign minister, paid visits to, uh, to Syria. There were messages of support early on from the rulers of Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the UAE to Bashar al-Assad. Um, and even if you, when you look at the timeline, I mean, you know, some of those messages were delivered as late as, as August. Um, and even then, there were there are credible reports of Gulf, Gulf outreach to Syria in the early days of the uprising, uh, promising political cover uh, and capital and other forms of support to, to Bashar al-Assad if he were to consider an enlarged uh, government, you know, inviting some elements of the opposition, you know, some co-opted elements of the opposition, and if he were to shift away from from Iran. Um, there's also uh, increasing uh, evidence that both Qatar and Turkey were uh, talking to some uh, uh, factions in the opposition 
trying to see if there was a way to broker a, a, a settlement between the two. And, and by this, I mean mostly uh, the, the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood that actually has very good relations with both the Qataris and the, and the Turks. Um, it seems like Assad himself rejected those overtures very early on, that the decision uh, to go for a security solution was made very clearly. There would be no, politi no serious political compromises and certainly no overtures to, to the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood itself, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, was not also very keen to go down this road. Um, they may be very important uh, within the Syrian opposition, but they're not dominant as they are elsewhere. Syrian opposition is much more diverse, and the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, like the Egyptian one, um, was surprised by how things were unfolding on the ground. They weren't driving it, uh, contrary to the, the uh, Assad regime's uh, narrative. I think the, the turning point uh, here was the perception of sectarian cleansing um, that developed in May and June of, uh, of last year, especially the assault against Tal Kala, for instance, and you know other villages on, um, on the Lebanese-Syrian uh, border. Um, there was a sense that Sunni uh, villages were being attacked to secure uh, the Alawi uh, hinterland and the border with Lebanon because of fear of smuggling and so on. And this is the moment where actually sectarian rhetoric started. Uh, uh, increasing and actually on, on both sides. Um, another important point here is uh, is the role of uh, Yusuf Qardawi. Um, I I don't think uh, what Qardawi says is scripted by uh, the Qatari government. I think uh, he is his own man and basically saw uh, the Syrian uprising as you know being part of a broader narrative in the region and became increasingly vocal on Al Jazeera. And if you look back at certain statements, this is what they were condemning at first, uh, Qardawi being uh, almost on the loose. And finally, uh, on, this, uh, on this issue, uh, it's also around uh, May, June, and especially in, during Ramadan, that we saw the videos, uh, some YouTube videos uh, um, emerging that showed, uh, for instance, uh, Sunni protesters that were captured by security forces forced to kneel on the floor, kiss uh, Bashar's Assad picture, and say, and, and, you know, there's a voice in the background, uh, who's your god, Bashar? I mean, that was like a, an insult to a lot of, you know, religious conservatives across the region. And, um, and the, the escalation picked up from, from there. Uh, there were official and semi-official um, attacks by uh, Syrians on, on Qatar, on Al Jazeera, pretending that Al Jazeera had built studios in the middle of nowhere, and, you know, all the riots and all the protests were being acted there. Um, there was also the storming of the Qatari embassy in, in July. And I think at this point it was a point of no return. Um, and it's at the same time as the Gulf states starting a bit mobilizing their own diplomatic assets. Uh, they checked Syria at the human, uh, UN Human Rights Council uh, both uh, in April and uh, in, um, in August. Uh, they actually even introduced a tougher statement uh, at, uh, at the Human Rights Council in, in, in August. Um, and they also denied Syria. Um, uh, Syria uh, ran to, uh, to uh, get a seat at the Human Rights Council, and the Gulf states uh, just went to Kuwait and said, okay, we'll put you up, and uh, they lined up the votes of everyone, and basically Syria couldn't get elected to the Human Rights Council. That was, I think, around June. Um, so the Gulf states were check trying to check Syria in those multilateral <laughs> forums. So there was the escalation, and then the escalation um, entered the, the month of Ramadan. And this is where I think a key turning point uh, uh, occurred. And that's the, the, the speech of, uh, of the Saudi monarch. And I'm, I'm going to quote uh, what uh, King Abdullah said. What is happening in Syria is not acceptable for Saudi Arabia. Syria should think wisely before it's too late and issue and enact reforms that are not, uh, that are not merely promises, but actual reforms. Either it chooses wisdom on its own, or it will be pulled down into the depths of turmoil and loss. And from that, then on, the Saudi rhetoric only escalated. Uh, the GCC action that ensued was basically a referral to the Arab League, but most importantly here, uh, the decision to withdraw the ambassadors of, of Kuwait, Oman, um, of Bahrain, um, Saudi Arabia, and, um, and Qatar, I mean, who had already left in, in July from Damascus. Uh, what's important to, to keep in mind is that Kuwait, Oman, and the UAE maintained embassy, the, uh, embassies there during this whole time. Um, and here also we have proof of the sectarian dimension. Um, in Bahrain, it's uh, Sunni MPs from Asala and Minbar, or friends, uh, 
that uh, that mobilized uh, actually against Syria. Now these are also uh, MPs who uh, you know were very much in favor of uh, the crackdown in Bahrain itself. So you know somehow uh, they they try to link the two that you know what's happening in Syria is the same as hap what's happening in Bahrain, and so essentially not about reform or anything. It was about sectarian passions and, and sectarian struggle for power. Uh, in Kuwait, uh, very similar dynamics took place. Uh, the, the, the MP who led this was uh, Walid uh, Tabatabai, who was uh, one of uh, the most vocal um, uh, Sunni MPs. And Saudi Arabia allowed demonstrations outside the Syrian embassy. Um, you know, when does Saudi Arabia ever allow demonstrations? Um, so that's a bit the context uh, before the, you know, the, the tougher Arab League diplomacy that we saw. The question now is what can the, the Gulf states do? I'm not going to run through the, what happened in the past two days. I think most of you are aware of the Arab League initiative and the collapse of the uh, Montreux mission. Uh, but the question for me is what can, can they do? What first is what they've already done in terms of offering a media platform to the opposition. And at this point, someone we can almost merge the, the newsroom of Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera, uh, given uh, you know how in sync uh, you know those those two medias have become. And, uh, it's, uh, if you look at the choice of um, of, um, uh, of guests, and uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's very clear that uh, they, I mean, Faisal Qasim has been, uh, you know, who's usually arbitrating between two sides. Um, we know where his heart is just by watching his uh, his show these days. Uh, there's a lot of propaganda coming from from the Gulf, obviously, and as I said earlier, there's a more insidious kind of rhetoric uh, on we saw in, in other um, <coughs> channels. Um, what the U.S. what the Gulf states can do um, is also lead uh, Arab League uh, action. Um, Qatar has been doing much of the heavy lifting now, um, largely because Qatar itself felt betrayed by what Assad has been done because of, you know this, this relationship that was strong and that completely faltered. Um, Qatar wasn't able to, to get Assad to do to do anything substantive, so they have to do something else. Um, and uh, Qatar is also uh, heading the ministerial committee of the Arab League, which means they have the that podium, um, they, they sit next to Nabil al arabi and they can set the tone uh, on this, and, and Hamad Ben Jassim has been uh, uh, very keen to do that. Uh, but there's a sense of declining, Arab, uh, uh, declining Qatari power, in, uh, in a sense. Um, it's largely because um, you know, Qatar alone cannot uh, keep all the Arab states in line. Uh, Qatar uh, works by stealth, uh, not if you have to sustain this effort on, on a long uh, Long, longer term. Um, it's also because uh, Qatar uh, will in March uh, lose the presidency of the Ministerial Committee of the Arab League, and that position will go to Iraq, and then there are big question marks about what uh, Iraq can do. So uh, Qatar, uh, Qatar feels uh, uh, pressed for time. Um, if you look at uh, the statement that the Arab League put out today to justify uh, you know, the withdrawal of it, all the monitors from the region and uh, uh, it's clear uh, from from Syria. Uh, it's clear that Saudi Arabia is now uh, setting the tone uh, here. Uh, it's Saudi Arabia that first announced to withdraw its <coughs> and that basically forced or compelled the other Gulf states to do so. I think uh, the Gulf states provide 50 or 60 of the 160 monitors, so it's not the majority, but it's still enough uh, to to um, collapse the um, um, the Arab League mission from from within. Uh, the statement of the GCC uh, uh, Council, uh, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council today, um, and, and I quote here, the, Gulf, the GCC states have decided to respond to the decision of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to withdraw its monitors from the Arab League delegation to Syria, and the GCC is certain the bloodshed and killing of innocents would continue and the Syrian regime would not abide by the Arab League's, res uh, Arab League's resolution. Um, not the mention of uh, Saudi Arabia in the first part of the sentence. Um, I think that, um, I'm not going to say it's the end of the Qatari chapter of diplomacy, uh, but it's certainly uh, Saudi Arabia has found a way to uh, uh, you know, co-author that, to, to that chapter from now on. And the Qataris will still play a, a, a dominant role in, in this diplomacy, uh, but the Saudis are throwing their weight in a much more decisive way. Um, the, the logic, uh, the Saudi logic, uh, is has been outlined by the Saudi ambassador to Britain today, uh, Prince Hamad, um, and I quote here: uh, "We pulled out the monitors because we didn't see any positive response from the Syrian government, but it's a process. 
take it to the UN Security Council to get the support on that initiative. We hope it doesn't reach an escalation um, or a military intervention. The last thing we want is an unstable region. We hope the Syrian regime will comply with the Arab initiative. I think this is a logical way out, a peaceful solution, a peaceful transition. Um, so the Saudis are not yet uh, uh, officially using the toughest of rhetoric, uh, but very clearly the Arab League plan calls for a transition out of power. Um, and uh, I, I suspect we're going to see a, a, a tougher official line. Another thing the Gulf states can do is help the unification of the opposition. Uh, at least that's an idea that uh, is floated around. But my question is on what terms? Um, up until now, the talk about unifying the opposition was basically brokering a deal between the two top umbrella groups in Syria. Uh, the SNC, the Syrian National Council, and the NCC, the National uh, Coordination Committee. <coughs> And uh, those talks faltered or largely because uh, the NCC uh, is opposed to the internationalization of the crisis, uh, any call for foreign intervention, and the NCC itself has no longer any credibility or legitimacy within, within Syria. Um, the SNC is in a better position, but even the SNC is, uh, you know, uh, basically, um, uh, dynamics on the street have, have overtaken uh, the, the SNC. Uh, <coughs> you will find few Syrians from within who uh, have a hope that the SNC can deliver something big, uh, and, and that's, that's a real problem. Now, if Saudi Arabia and Qatar manage to convince all parts of the opposition to endorse the Arab League plan, that would be quite a victory. At least that would, you know, um, and that would be forcing the hand of the NCC. I would suspect some of the NCC member would then leave the NCC and join any other opposition groups within Syria that are more amenable to, to dialogue with, with, the, uh, with the regime, like uh, uh, Lu'ay Hussein's uh, group, but that's, that's one option. Another thing that the Gulf states can do is offer incentives for Assad uh, and his, uh, uh, his clique to leave power. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, safe haven and the, unfreeze, the conditional unfreezing of assets as time goes back. It's important to realize that uh, um, Syrian assets and, uh, um, in, in the UAE, especially in Dubai, are, are significant. Uh, I, I drove around with, with a few Syrians uh, in December, and basically they point at, uh, you know, this building is owned by this guy from Hamas, and this other guy was, uh, you know, is an associate of Hami Makhlouf, and so on. There's, there are significant holdings there. And the question is whether the UAE authorities um, can identify those individuals and if they can be sanctioned quickly enough. Um, but the problem here when it comes to the issue of safe haven is would Assad really consider going uh, in exile in a country that actively uh, contributed to his own demise? I mean, would, would he really go to the UAE or Qatar or some other place? I doubt it. So it's not a, uh, uh, I don't think this is a very viable plan. Another thing the Gulf states can do is coordinate with, with Turkey. I mean, there is uh, there's a wide agreement in um, in the Gulf states that Turkey is the single most important actor, the most powerful, a direct neighbor of, of Syria. Um, but there is also another element here. Which there is a sense among Gulf officials that um, if they don't talk to Turkey quickly and in a serious way, um, Turkey is best positioned to shape the outcome in Syria, and somehow they would be losing. Uh, so there is a, 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 like a, a kind of competition between the two, but the Gulf states know that they really need Turkey to operate in in Syria, not alone. Um, so uh, this is a discussion that's happening um, as we go. Now the problem is that Turkey is nervous about many things, uh, Russia, Iran, Iraq obviously, the Kurds, and in a way the sectarian dimension of Gulf mobilization. Turkey is not very comfortable with, with this. Um, and then there is a question of what can the Gulf states offer Turkey? I mean, we know what Turkey can offer the Gulf states in a way, but what can the Gulf states offer Turkey? Turkey, if it's going to alienate <coughs> Iran and Iraq and others in, in, this, uh, uh, in this effort. Another thing that the Gulf states can do is talk to China and, uh, and Russia. Uh, that's true, and they're doing it. But it's important to, to keep in mind that the Gulf, the Gulf agenda towards these two countries um, is multidimensional. It's not just about Syria. It's also about energy. It's also about, uh, about Iran. So for them, it's, a, it's very difficult to, to operate uh, and, and get the, 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 the Russians and the Chinese to, to do what, what they want. And add to that the legacy of Libya. Um, there is real distrust between the Gulf states and, and, and Russia over, over Libya. The, the Russians now see the, the 
golf businessmen flocking into Libya, <coughs> seeking opportunities, and they see this as a net loss for, for the Russians. Um, it's also important to note that there are very bad relations between Qatar and Russia, as we speak. Just a couple months ago, uh, the Russian ambassador and security guards at the <coughs> Doha airport uh, just fought. They, they punched each other and so on, and, and the Russian ambassador packed his stuff and left, and it, it, there was a real uh, escalation between, between the two countries. But it is as important for the Gulf states to talk to South Africa, India, Morocco, and Pakistan, who also sit on the Security Council. Um, yes, a Russian veto would trump all that, but imagine if Russia were to abstain. Well, Pakistan, given the Pakistan um, and Saudi relations, I think Pakistan is a, is a sure vote uh, at, at, the, at the UN, but still you have to work on this. Uh, Morocco, in a way, has replaced Lebanon, which is good news, uh, because Lebanon would not have done any, anything, um, would have abstained or voted against. Uh, South Af Africa and India, these are two uh, emerging powers. Uh, powers at this moment, and they need to be engaged at the level of Saudi Arabia, taken seriously as powers, and their own concerns have to, have to be addressed. Another thing that the Gulf states can do is talk to Iran. Um, Qatar has done that, but given um, the dire uh, sta uh, state of uh, regional uh, uh, relations, I don't think that conversation is going to go very, very far. Um, another option here is support the armed uh, opposition uh, in Syria, and we'll get that in the uh, Q&A. Um, I hear a lot of rumors about this, and um, I, I mean, in, uh, in August, uh, David Ignatius wrote uh, a column in which he asserted, uh, to counter the Iranians, a newly emboldened Saudi Arabia has been pumping money to Sunni fighters in Syria. Um, but there's, so far, there's no evidence of massive support. Um, anyone has talked to the FSA, met with them, and so on. I mean, uh, no one is impressed by the kind of weaponry they have or uh, a state-of-the-art communication and so on. Maybe some money is going to buy the loyalty of some individuals or tribes, uh, but we don't see that, that, that kind of support having an impact on the type of armed opposition to the regime uh, we're, we're seeing. Um, and if there is support, I suspect a lot of it is coming not from the states, uh, the, not the Gulf states themselves, but from individuals who are very sympathetic. <coughs> Um, let me end by making a couple of, of points about um, the, the current politics and the limits of GCC influence. Um, as I said, we, we've entered a new era of Arab diplomacy towards, uh, towards Syria. It's not, as I said, it's not the end of the, the color chapter, it's just that the Saudi chapter is being written uh, in parallel. Um, Saudi, uh, Saud al Faisal meeting with the SNC two, three days ago was in a very important uh, 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 development, the withdrawal of uh, monitors, obviously. Um, but uh, here is a reality. The Gulf states don't know the Syrian opposition. Um, if you ask, and I've asked uh, Syrian opposition figures, uh, whether they prefer to be based in Doha or Riyadh or Istanbul or Paris, London, and New York, they, they want to be in Istanbul. They want, they want to be in, uh, in London. Um, there is no permanent base yet in, in the Gulf. And that's because they're not as comfortable as people assume they are. Uh, yes, they have relationships and so on, but they really worry about, about that, that agenda. Um, another point is that the Gulf states have different entry points into Syria um, that are not completely coordinated. If you're Qatar, you've dealt for years with the, the Assad regime, so you've developed a relationship with, uh, with, business, with senior businessmen and others. Uh, but these businessmen, like Nabil Kuzbari, who sits on, uh, who was the chairman of Sham Holding, the key money man to. Uh, to the Assad family and uh, Rami Makhlouf, uh, he sat on a number of boards in Qatar, um, actually on boards that Sheikh Hamouza uh, uh, led. Um, Qatar has also obviously uh, good relations with the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, through Qardawi and, and others, uh, but also with key independent SNC figures. Uh, Burhan Ghaliun um, has a friendship with Azmi Bishara, who is actually a key person, uh, you know, helping the Qataris think about those, those issues. They sat together at the Doha Institute and other places. So they are long-standing ties. Now, for Qatar and the UAE, the game is different. They've always been very distrustful of the Muslim Brotherhood, wherever it was, you know, in Syria, in, uh, in Syria, but also in Egypt and Tunisia. I mean, Syria is no different. It's not that they have in-depth knowledge uh, of, of the Muslim Brotherhood. So their channels are going through um, <coughs> tribes, and especially for Saudi Arabia, tribes, the al okay, uh, tribe, the Shamma, uh, the Bagas and, and others, and we can get in more detail later. The Salafis, but the Salafis in Syria don't seem to be a 
an important element of the opposition. They seem to be very marginal. Um, and former regime figures. I mean, let's not forget that uh, Abdul Khalim Khaddam and others uh, have had ties with the Soviets for, for a long time. For the UAE, it's mostly businessmen uh, who are entry point into Syria. Majid al Futaim uh, had uh, a you know great projects in, in uh, uh, he's from Dubai. Uh, great projects in uh, in Syria. Uh, they're all frozen at the moment. Um, I can you know there's several other uh, Emirati businessmen that I can mention. Um, but my point is that they don't understand the full sp and, and they're not um, familiar with the full spectrum of the Syrian opposition, which is going to get even more fragmented and diverse as time goes by, because there will be more defectors with other calculations than you know, the original opposition members. And so I, I'm, I worry that um, the Gulf states cannot have a unifying effect, because uh, they have favorites here and there, um, and that's going to be problematic for them. Um, also, uh, the Gulf states have very few relations with the Kurds and the minorities in Syria. I mean, if I'm Kurd, uh, Kurdish or a Christian in Syria, I'm not sure um, you know, Saudi uh, uh, guarantees are what's going, uh, what is going to calm me down, right? Um, so, you know, that's that's another uh, problem. Uh, let me end here. Um, it's a lot, and I'm sorry that's taken for too long. Thank you. Okay, we'll open the floor uh, to questions. Um, I'll get my attention. I'll get a list going here. Um, State your name and affiliation. And Neil, I'm going to ask the first question. Um, are there any lessons you take in your analysis about <laughs> Syria and the role of Islamic groups and the opposition from what's taken place in Egypt and Libya? For example, during Tahrir Square, we heard many diverse voices and uh, new faces and we see the composition of the Egyptian parliament. You've been talking with, with the FSA and many of the others. How Islamic is the opposition? Is that a problem? And uh, what do you think the role of, of the brothers and others might be uh, in a post assad Syria? Well, it is undeniable that um, there is a strong Islamic Islamist character um, to, to the uprising, but um, it is not the you know, hardcore Salafi, uh, you know, jihadi kind of uh, uh, you know, dimension. Uh, it's uh, you, you meet with a lot of uh, of defectors who um, you know are very aware that the end game is not a, a military victory, but a shift in the loyalties of um, many minorities, uh, including the Alawite. Um, and a lot of them basically say, uh, listen, those sectarian passions in, in Syria have been created and fueled by the regime itself. So embracing that would actually be a victory for, for the regime. Now, I'm, I'm going, not going to pretend that I've talked to everyone in the FSA or, or elsewhere, but actually I've been, um, just a, a story. Uh, I met with an FSA commander in, in November, and someone in the room uh, has, has met with him uh, uh, more recently. And uh, you know what he was telling me is that uh, one of the networks they used to move defectors across the country had a lot of Christian participation in it, and they actually helped defectors, and that's very important. And, and um, others, uh, you know, Syrian refugees uh, tell you that, for instance, in uh, in Hamas, um, they give their keys to their Christian or uh, you know Ismaili uh, uh, neighbors and, and so on, and they trust them more. And you know, if if they need to. The past messages and so on, they rely on minorities. I think Syria does have a the kind of, you know, um, inter-confessional uh, um, uh, tissue fabric um, that, uh, uh, you know, is solid, is solid enough. I mean, of course, it's, it's eroding, but we, we're not past the point of, of no return. And there is also acute awareness that what is needed now is early guarantees by Islamist group, including the Muslim Brothers, for the minorities. And that could be a game changer in terms of shifting the loyalties of, of minorities. And this is, in a way, the real failure of, of, the, of the SNC, uh, if I may. Uh, yes, there is diverse uh, membership in the SNC, uh, but many of those non-Sunni figures are uh, not you know, dominant figures in their own communities. Um, I mean, uh, and uh, 
it, but there is awareness of, of that failure among them. It's, it's very difficult for, for the Syrians who for a long time thought of themselves as non-sectarian um, to actually shift to a sectarian mode and say, okay, we have to deal with them as a community from now on and you know, almost provide uh, uh, promises for the day there is constitutional and institutional reforms in Syria that their rights will be, will, be, will be protected. But this is certainly a discussion I hear all the time. And I'm very uh, wary of you know, any talk that the opposition is Islamist, uh, fundamentally. And there, is, there is variety in, in the capital. Um, thank you very much, Jamil, for your, your presentation. Two, two quick, I'm sorry. Two, two quick, quick questions. questions. Um, one concerning the mentioned shock, I think it's a very important point. point. Do you yeah. actually hear um, you know, folks in the saying, OK, we Way, way to channel to channel their channel support to to Syria for the opposition is through the Syrian networks. Um, two, um, which um, of the you talked about also the outreach to the regime in terms of getting you know, an offer to get the shard of the um, country? Are there certain there is a lot of talk out there about, for example, the UAE being particular still having some channels open with Bashar, and that they're going to be the ones that offer him. Golden parachute, or the get a jail free card, or whatever place to. Um, what, what, what's the talk about? What you know? Which countries and which leaders in particular, on a personal level, way to lead that? Well, your point on the tribes is, is very important. I mean, um, we can go down the, the list of tribes, uh, the Bagas and the uh, Awaidat and um, Shamar and so on. Um, you know, you meet a lot of uh, Syrian uh, uh, tribal chiefs who actually have dual Saudi. Uh, uh, Syrian citizenship. There are actually tribes that extend all the way to uh, to Kuwait, and and uh, I, I mean I heard Bahrain, although I, I haven't met uh, uh, the, 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 these people. Um, it, it, it's, um, the tribes are important, but actually, if you look at the current map in terms of unrest, uh, the tribal heavy regions are not yet, you know, up in arms. Uh, you know, from Derzor, Waka, the Euphrates uh, 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 River. Um, and the further to the south. Now, Daha is, Daha is a tribal region, and it is up in arms, and I won't argue with it. But what I'm trying to suggest is that um, I don't think there has been a decision by tribes to, um, to confront the regime yet. There's still ongoing discussions with, with, with Saudi Arabia. This certainly is going to be a, um, a, an important uh, uh, channel uh, of Gulf intervention, uh, should, should it happen. But let me give you a sense. I actually spent a, a few uh, few hours, a couple of days, looking at uh, just researching tribes and so on. And you know, the okay, that uh, tribe, and actually go on their website. Uh, uh, they have a website on which they have pictures uh, the the the, uh, the new uh, Syrian flag. I mean, because they changed from the Basis flag to you know the old flag with the with the with the start and the Saudi flag next to each other. Um, and uh, there's a big slogan, al Nasser al Shab al Suri, the victory for the Syrian people. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is the tribe of the Dosari family. Those of us who spend time in the Gulf know that this is one of the big uh, Gulf families. Um, and uh, that has connections with, with, uh, with others. Um, if you look at, you know, the Baggala tribe, uh, very interesting. Back in, um, in August, uh, the head of the Bakara tribe, uh, Sheikh al Bashir, uh, was featured on Syrian television um, supporting uh, Bashar al-Assad, you know, very strong words of support and so on. Then three weeks ago, he emerged in, um, he emerged in uh, Egypt, in Cairo, um, and gave a long interview to, to Al, uh, al Jazeera in which he trashed, uh, actually not a long, but uh, in which he trashed the, the, the regime and actually he, uh, he took his family with him. He's a defector for, you know, I mean, that's nothing. And he said he made those comments um, in terms of, of uh, because he was coerced to, 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 do, to, to make them. Um, I think there will be important levers, but it, also, it is also a mistake for the Gulf states or anyone to think that the tribes somehow represent a consensus or you know, a dominant group inside, inside Syria. This is also an urbanized country. We saw, we saw this in Hamas, Hama, in, and especially in Aleppo and, uh, and Damascus, uh, where most of the population is, is, uh, is concentrated. So it would be a mistake to go there. Now, the Bagaras are big in Aleppo, for instance, uh, and, and other places. Um, but it is a mistake to use the tr tribes as a prison to interpret events within, within Syria. On your, um, on your second question, um, 
I certainly hope that you know the Gulf states uh, keep channels open to to Syria uh, to to Bashar al-Assad to tell him you know there is a way out if if you go and there is no violence. Uh, the reality is, I think the moment of opportunity that existed back in would say April, May, perhaps up till in June has has uh, has vanished. Uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, has clearly thrown his lot with uh, uh, with Iran. I mean, you know, counts on Iranian support on um, on. Uh, Hezbollah support and, and other to, to weather the storm. Um, so I, I don't think, I mean, even if I suspect there are individuals, and there are individuals who, who would like to, to broker that kind of settlement, um, there's no opportunity in there. Uh, Jared Cable. Uh, thank, thank you, Terry, Terry Taylor, Taylor, the International, International Council of Life Sciences. Uh, thank, thank you very much for giving us a perspective that's uh, hard to see from here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I heard a rather bleak analysis this morning from a regional expert that said there's no light at the end of the tunnel as far as Syria is concerned. That's a bit of That uh, Bashar Assad and the regime have sufficient support within the country to sustain themselves over a very long period, whilst opposition, as you eloquently described is, is widespread geographically but disparate and, and coherence is very hard to see in the shorter term how uh, they can be made into a coherent opposition. Uh, externally, uh, it seems they're insulated from the military intervention from outside. They have support from the Security Council, permanent member of Russia, and they have other supporters from outside, they being the regime from outside of Syria. And this analysis said, well, this could go on for a very long time. If one thinks about Libya, uh, there was external military intervention in that case, but you can imagine if that didn't happen, that situation could have gone on for a very long time. I wonder what your, perhaps you could say a little bit more about the supporters of the regime in a more fine-grained way within Syria, um, and what do you think of that analysis? I still think the balance of power is in Bashar al-Assad's favor at this point, but it's quickly eroding. Um, you know, um, I mean, in terms of, of legitimacy, um, this, this regime's argument for a long time is that, you know, we may not be the nicest people on earth, but we provide stability, and, and if you're a businessman, you can prosper, and, you know, we'll, we'll make deals and so on. Those arguments are vanishing, and they're back to, you know, the most existential one, which is, um, you know, there are Sunni hordes out there and you know, we have to protect ourselves. It's a very sectarian argument, which is going to scare a lot of people, and including inside the Alawite community, because how sustainable is it to you know, uh, um, have a, uh, you know, a coalition of minorities, a very unstable one and uh, an increasingly poor uh, one to, to, to hold the, the, the uh, power? Um, I think that there is a very important uh, uh, part of that story, which is the economy. Syria's economy is, uh, there's no economy to speak of anymore, to be, to be fully honest. Um, you know, tourism is gone, uh, electricity cuts are everywhere, uh, no access to you know, very basic products, uh, you know, medicines, uh, cooking gas, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, the, the con and it's not a country that has uh, independent sources, uh, you know, of, of cash. I mean, you know, the, the sanctions on on Syria's oil export have had an impact. Uh, so, you know, that that lifeline uh, ha has gone. Um, it will take time for Syria to reorient its trade from Turkey to Iraq or other places. I mean, that doesn't happen uh, overnight. You know, the, its foreign reserves are are dropping quickly. I, mean, I don't. I, I think the the dollar is at 75. Is that 74, 75? Um, these days, um, um, it's it's actually, um, and and then you meet actually uh, Syrian businessmen who are associated with the regime, saying it's going. I mean, the question is when and how long. Now, that said, I, I do uh, uh, accept the argument that the regime has still a lot of firepower to deploy. Um, uh, you know, it, it's only. From what I understand, it's using something like 20 to 25 percent of its forces for repression. Um, you know, these are the most loyal units uh, for them. It's deploying the most loyal units because it's wor really worried about infections and so on. The question is how sustainable that is. Uh, you know, those tanks need fuel. Uh, 
uh, those soldiers uh, need to rest. Uh, I think they psychologically, I mean, after shooting at civilians for several months, they're psychologically affected. Uh, you need you need them to rest, and if they are going to go to rest, you have to deploy another brigade to do that. Now, if you're not that sure about this new, you know, not certain of this new brigade's loyalty, uh, then you're in trouble. So Syria now, right now is undergoing its own version of security sector reform, which is embedding uh, loyalists, some of the shabihas and so on, into regular army units to make sure that they are deployed, they will stand their ground, and they, they will fight. But you need a lot of money to, to do that, and. Um, it's, it's very difficult, and, and there is capital flight out of Syria. Um, I'm not sure in Syria where all this money is going, uh, perhaps Lebanon, but also other, other places. And if you're a Syrian businessman right now, uh, and even if you, know, you, you owe your success to, uh, to Bashar al-Assad and your connection with this regime, um, are you going to really repatriate your capital from you know, the UAE or elsewhere into Syria to actually finance pro-Bashar al-Assad demonstrations and, and so on? Not really. Um, it, he doesn't, it doesn't look like he's, he may survive a year, but maybe not five. Uh, and I, my money is much less than five uh, um, uh, years. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that his demise is inevitable, uh, but it's extremely probable. And, and a lot of the minorities, and a lot of uh, uh, you know, the senior figures in minorities, business, and, and elsewhere, are actually thinking about the day after the kind of deals they can strike from now on. And the problem for them is with whom can they strike those deals? I mean, it's not as if the opposition is so unified that they can provide guarantees or that the FSA has a leadership somewhere uh, with whom you can make a deal. There will be no violence in those regions if we shift loyalty. I mean, you know, this, this is the kind of problem. This is why I think it is very important for the opposition to continue its effort to consolidate, even at the cost of, at the price of shedding some elements on the side. And I think there are some elements in the opposition um, who are opposition only by name, actually are doing in a way that the regime's bidding. Okay. Let's take a, a group of questions this next time around uh, so we can get everyone in. I'll start with uh, Marissa. Community is as diverse as the rest of, of Syria, and uh, how have they how have they played a role? Uh, how have they broken down with respect to support or not? I mean, obvious or not obvious. And second question, uh, I wonder if you comment on how the Gulf states have viewed the activities of the U.S. ambassador and some other Western ambassadors. Uh, I don't know whether there were any Arab ambassadors who participated, but uh, what was reported. Well, let's, uh, let's take a few more and then on this side. On this side. Thank, Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Jay uh, My question is, uh, first, during your presentation, you said that dynamics on the street have overtaken the SNC. Can you expand on that a little bit? And uh, the second question is that uh, it's been reported that the ranks of the FSA are filled predominantly with uh, Sunni army defectors. During your travels, did you notice a sectarian dimension to the FSA, or do you think that there's a potential for that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chris Bidwell? I say pass on the mic. Uh, Chris Bidwell, Camille, thank you for your uh, presentation. Enjoyed it greatly. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you can kind of explain to us. We, we watched, and sometimes in this in this country we talk about the Arab Spring. We watched uh, you know, events in Egypt. We watched events in, in, in Libya. Events in Bahrain. Can you kind of tell us how Syria is different? How how it's how it's uh, matriculating differently than, than those events? What what are the what are the unique identifiers of that? And kind of a second part of that uh, is there what would be the effect? Of, of current events in, in Syria, of, uh, of any military intervention by any party. Uh, how, how might that play out? How might that uh, change the dynamics of, of, of uh, current disagreements? Well, first, um, I wish I could find an a Arab ambassador that you know is as courageous as Ambassador Ford, but I, I don't think this is a defining uh, force. 
uh, defining quality of uh, Arab foreign service uh, personnel. Um, you know, I, I wish I wish there was that kind of uh, immediate. Uh, uh, um, no, because I mean, let's be honest, uh, they haven't been active on the ground. Um, I don't know at a personal level in small circles and so on, but nothing that captured the imagination of, of anyone. Um, I, I'm going to interpret your questions a bit differently. I'm going to look at how the Gulf states perceive U.S. policy in general, not just a thing. Because for me, Ambassador Ford is U.S. policy. As far as I'm concerned, there is no U.S. policy at this time. It's it's what Ford does uh, and doesn't do, and you know, dictated by that that is policy. Um, at early on, um, I think uh, there was a very flawed policy. You know, I, I still remember sitting in uh, at Carnegie listening to Ambassador Kerry explaining to us how Bashar was a reformer. Uh, sorry, uh, apology. Um, um, and then you know uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, um, Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, talking about Bashar leading reforms and then leading the transition. And so, and from the Gulf state, the the perception was that. The U.S. doesn't think Bashar is on his way out, so we're not going to actually push for it. It's actually once you saw a shift in the U.S. position that the Arab states said, okay, their own intelligence assessment is that, are that Bashar is, is going to, to fall. Uh, therefore, you know, yet, yet another reason to, uh, to, to jump on that, that bad, bad bargain. Um, for the moment, to be honest, the, I don't know what's the level of, uh, of dialogue between the Gulf states and, and the U.S. on Syria. I assume it's, it's pretty high. I have no particular insight um, on this, but it's each country is waiting for the other one to take action, right? I mean, we all waited for Turkey to do something, and then Turkey told us we need uh, it needs uh, an Arab cover, and then it shifted to the Arab League, and the U.S. is actually wants Arab cover and Turkish uh, muscle to actually do something. So there's a there's a real waiting game uh, at this level, and I don't. I'm I'm just curious. And that's, that's an open question from my side, how it will unfold now. I mean, will the U.S. say, that's it, the Gulf states has, have taken a stand just as they did on Libya uh, you know, in, in March. Um, we have to uh, uh, push a resolution to the Security Council. Um, the Gulf states will help us uh, uh, change Russia's mind uh, and you know, uh, Russia may abstain and so on. This is where the, the real game is for me. Um, on the business community, um, I think the business community really thought the first three months that uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, could, could win. I mean, that he has enough uh, manpower, firepower to, to, to win that round. To be honest, uh, once they saw uh, US sanctions, EU sanctions, and Arab sanctions, when they saw uh, that he's losing part of the, uh, parts of the country, uh, once they saw, for instance, that the crucial highway from uh, you know, Damascus to Aleppo now it goes through Hamas and then Hama, is at stake, so you know, industrial activity is suffering uh, because of electricity costs. I mean, and they're actually losing confidence in his ability to, you know, create that kind of, you know, the uh, kind of environment that is uh, uh, protective of their their own interests. Uh, I've personally talked to uh, to uh, pro Assad businessmen who think he's not going to survive that. Way. Now the question is, how do they hedge? Who do they talk to? Uh, who approaches them, and who do they approach? Um, and I think there is a need for a lot of uh, outreach or a lot of messaging uh, towards towards this community. Um, and uh, actually, Mona Yacoubian, I think, in, in the room, wrote about this uh, several months ago. But you know, a more uh, specific outreach towards you know the, those key constituencies in in, uh, in in the in the regime to hasten its its collapse. Um, others, especially if you're a businessman and from a minority. Um, you're a lot more fearful. I think if you're a Sunni and a businessman, you can all you have uh, enough interlocutors, uh, you know, that you can find someone to, to protect your back. For the minorities, it, it will have to be a almost a group decision, uh, I suspect. Um, on, um, on the question of uh, dynamics on on the street, I, I do believe now that the uprising is is uh, driven by local dynamics. I don't believe that there is a central command anywhere. Um, in, you know, I think Syrian protesters uh, coordinate when it comes to strategic messaging, which is how do we call our Friday, right? I mean, that's that has been uh, important in terms of mobilizing people and you know one clear message every weekend and so on. Um, but it's not that, and 
and they all demonstrate on, on Fridays, but it's not that the, the guys in uh, Zabadani calls, call those in uh, uh, Idlib and we say, okay, we're going to do that kind of action and you coordinate so we'll actually, uh, uh, you know, the attention of the military will be divided and so on. It, it's not, uh, that's not how it's working. I think it's working because local dynamics, the need for self-defense and so on, require uh, resort to uh, to, uh, to weaponry and to, to the use of, of, of violence or you know um, against against the regime and I think this is in a way a dangerous dynamic uh, because you know lots of pockets of unrest are of course problematic for the regime but they're easier to manage than uh, you know a national insurgency that is fully coordinated and that you know has to that knows how to test the, the pressure points of the military and the shabihas and, and so on. Um, it also allows the regime to cast this as a, you know, uh, to, to um, create a narrative of, you know, gangs and so on. If it's not a national uprising, uh, then you can always say these are gangs operating everywhere. And this is what the, 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 the propaganda of the regime has been, has been about. Um, on your question about uh, the, the FSA, I would say that, you know, from my own context, uh, the FSA is overwhelmingly formed of uh, Sunni uh, uh, soldiers who have defected. Uh, but then again, I haven't met everyone, so I, I can't tell. Um, the FSA is also very clear, they don't accept civilians, or don't, they don't yet accept civilians in, in their own ranks. Um, if you want to be part of the FSA, you still have to show your military uh, issued uh, ID. Um, that's how they, uh, they're very worried about informants, trading the structure they're very worried also about uh, you know a breakdown in discipline and they worry about you know the armed gangs effects which is you know um, you will have the emergence of warlords here and there where they believe that military discipline will prevent that um, they all pay um, uh, how do you say uh, lip service I think to the command in, in Turkey uh, but I've heard from enough of them that not all their actions or you know most of their actions are not coordinated with Riyadh uh, al-Assad or the new general Sheikh who you know, wants to form a military council in, in Turkey. Um, and on Chris's uh, question, uh, how is Syria different? Well, it's different in the sense, first, that it has lasted uh, a lot longer, uh, that it has a greater sectarian dimension than elsewhere, although I don't think that the sectarian dimension is the whole, is the totality of the story. I do believe that many of those grievances and demands are legitimate. Uh, but you, one cannot den deny this. Um, it's also because of the immediate neighbors. I mean, you know, in, in Libya, I mean, yes, Algeria was not very happy with the intervention, but didn't do much. Tunisia was, you know, not concerned with this. I mean, they were concerned about Libyan refugees entering the country and so on. It created pressures. But it's not as if this Tunisian government you know, was opposed uh, to that. The Egyptians were busy with their own troubles and weren't, you know, didn't want to seize uh, 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 Libyan oil fields or, or anything. And the African states had to cross a desert before coming to uh, Gaddafi's rescue. And, uh, Syria operates in a very different environment. Uh, they, you know, now they see, uh, look how quickly um, the relationship with Turkey broke down and how quickly the relationship with Iraq. Uh, uh, solidified around sectarian concerns uh, with, with Iraq. Um, there is the Arab-Israeli dimension, which allows always, uh, you know, the, the Humana uh, uh, narrative to hold some uh, um, or, or to, to convince some that there is actually a conspiracy at stake. Um, but in terms of the basic demands and grievances of the, of the population, I think they're they're the same. I think they're the same all across the region. You know, from from. Uh, Tunisia to, to Bahrain, so uh, that's not that's not a fundamentally uh, that's not a fundamentally different uh, uh, dimension. On on military intervention, um, I you know I, I'm still uh, struggling with with this because when when there was an intervention in Iraq and that that was invasion occupation and long term occupation, we all worried about the contagion effects and you know that country after country would collapse mm -hmm. and so on. And I'm not going to pretend that there were no in, uh, effects on, on other parts of the region. You know, lots of refugees and yes, there was destabilization and the, the, uh, in the fabric and so on. But we didn't see government, uh, you know, country after country entering, uh, entering civil war. And I, I'm wondering whether 
the more time uh, the civil war uh, or the, the, the unrest in Syria lasts, the more immune the countries will get just because they will treat this as a, as a constant, not as a variable, right? I mean, Syria is in trouble and we all try to protect ourselves. Um, I don't know how, um, I don't think Lebanon, uh, the system in Lebanon is, for instance, resilient enough uh, to, to deal with this, to be honest. A, a, a long protracted struggle in Syria is certainly going to have an impact in Lebanon. It's already starting, there are shootings across the border, the Syrian army is penetrating into Lebanon, there are refugees, the economy has taken a hit, and so on. I can't talk about Iraq because I don't know Iraq, I've never been, uh, and so, uh, but if you look at, you know, Jordan is very nervous. Uh, Jordan, because there is a tribal element as well, they worry about all the smuggling and, and the economy in Jordan is, is an issue. A lot of Jordanian imports need, uh, and export need, need the roads through, uh, um, uh, through Syria. Um, so, I mean, the, I still think on the whole, the military intervention will have a, a seriously destabilizing uh, uh, factor. But the question for me is, if, if, the, if somehow Syria turns into only a proxy war, is it worse or is it better or worse than you know a NATO intervention or a Turkish-led incursion in the north and so on? The longer it lasts, uh, the greater ch the chances for the Syrian uprising to turn into a proxy war are. And that's what I'm worried about. I'm not sure the, the Saudis or others will know how to stabilize Syria at any one point. I mean, look at how they did in Yemen or Lebanon over time. And that's not where my, my money would be. Okay. Oda, uh, you said you don't know much about Iraq. But if we look at the Iraqi experience, the U.S. had 180,000 troops. And then six weeks, the regime collapsed. Despite the collapse of the regime, that was resistant until today. The Syrian regime is similar to the Iraqi regime. So if you do have a foreign intervention, it has to be really massive. It has to be. Secondly, if you take a look at Al Anbar province, which is a Sunni province, a hotbed of the Iraqi insurgency, is there any cooperation between the Sunnis of Al Anbar and the Syrian opposition? There was a question back there. Yes. Yes, please. Hi, Elise Labitt from CNN. Um, can you talk a little bit more about Iran and their calculations about um, at what point you think they might just conclude that this is a losing battle and the fact that um, Hamas does seem to be want to leave um, its political office to be, to be leaving Syria, whether you think that um, signifies that um, more of the Islamic movements are, are moving away and, and how you think, what do you think perhaps even that at some point if Iran um, loses interest that perhaps Hezbollah could follow, if you could um, take that on. Well, um, your question uh, first on, um, on Iraq, um, I mean, I don't want to give the impression that I support an intervention. I haven't made up my mind for the, for the moment, uh, to be honest. But intervention doesn't necessarily mean occupation. And, and you know, we're not talking about the same uh, scenario um, uh, here. Um, there are other uh, scenarios, you know, from you know, buffer zones to uh, uh, you know, uh, humanitarian corridors and so on. I don't know how military feasible a number of them are. And most people I talk to say it, 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 it's going to be a lot harder. But we're not envisioning a, you know, um, troops entering all the way into into Damascus and you know liberating Syria the, the same way. I think there is no appetite anywhere. We're talking about much more limited intervention. Um, and uh, to be honest, if uh, if uh, Saddam Hussein survived six weeks um, in 2003, I suspect that uh, there was the same kind of uh, assets and resources deployed. Um, Shell asset would be gone in two weeks, a week. I mean, it's not as if the Syrian army was this uh, massive, fearsome uh, uh, one. And it would be, at this point, uh, it's the Libya model where people would see this as them coming to our rescue rather than them being invader. Um, would, I think for me, would be more uh, the more uh, adequate uh, uh, comparison. Um, on um, 
On your question on, on the uh, on bar tribes, uh, on Alan Bar and so on, it's important. Uh, this is a, a very good comment. Uh, these are tribes mostly in Alan Bar, right? The, the Al Anis and so on, and lots of them are, um, uh, you know, Shamar, and uh, they actually some of the tribes I, I, uh, I mentioned, the Lanza and other, are, are uh, you know present in Syria and and in uh, and in Iraq as well. The question here is. What are the Saudis doing? I mean, if someone can mobilize them, it's of all foreign actors, it would be the, it, it, it's the Saudis, uh, no one else. And I have a hard time believing that uh, the Alan Bar tribe would actually trust the Americans after having fought them, you know, in 2004, 2005, then switched uh, during the awakening, and then you know, feeling dropped and left alone by the Americans later, you know, with the withdrawal that. Somehow, that's a that's an alliance that can take place. This is entirely the Gulf states' uh, portfolio responsibility. If something were to happen, um, those tribes can provide fighters, but they're not rich. Um, they, you know, they will still need funding and weaponry from from elsewhere. So they will have to to uh, to rely on the Gulf states. Um, the question on uh, it is uh, on uh, on Iran and uh, on their calculations. I think the Iranians that still believe that. Michelle Assad can uh, can ride out the storm, and their brother their brothers in arms. Um, my point here is that those who own the Iran Syria relationship are the dark security types who have been working together for the past thirty years, and we don't know what kind of brotherhood uh, that uh, uh, they're in. I mean, you know, I'm I'm very worried that people think it's only a matter of big strategy, right? Uh, top policymakers in Iran saying uh, that's it, uh, you know. That, that's costing not too much and so on. These guys have been working together for the past 30 years and uh, those who own the relationship are security guys. They're not uh, strategists or you know, businessmen on two sides. Um, so their, their own uh, um, uh, worldview, their own outlook is, is going to be key. And I suspect um, it's going to be very difficult to get them to, to relinquish such, such an ally after, after years of uh, uh, decades of cooperation. Another important element is that since 2006, Syria, um, Syria's own alliance with Iran, which had been deepening throughout the 90s and, and later, um, has taken a qualitative turn. Um, you know, Syria has been investing more in you know uh, uh, missiles, you know, surface surface uh, missiles, uh, its own defense procurement. A lot of it came through Iran and so on. So I I, I assume that uh, the penetration of Iranian um, uh, of Syria's military has actually been greater. Uh, and the Iranians have a better understanding of, of how things happen in, in Iran. On the Palestinian issue, um, you know, one thing I, I was told in, in, in Beirut by people who are operating in those circles is, and, and that, that was in December, so I was talking, I was very excited about, you know, Mish'al and others breaking with, uh, with Syria. And one, one person told me, Emil, don't get too excited. Um, ultimately, um, the uh, Hamas's security apparatus abroad is completely dependent and penetrated by Hezbollah. Um, and they will read any shift as betrayal. Now, put aside also the brotherhood here, there's also this other dimension that Hamas abroad cannot operate uh, in total uh, freedom, independence. Uh, they are reliant on, on those things. So I think it's going to take a very bruising uh, uh, battle within Hamas to get to the point where they will actually denounce uh, um, Syria. Well, don't you, can I just a quick follow? I mean, don't you think Khalid Michel resigning <coughs> and well, staying in Syria and kind of... Um, well, he's, it's not that he's resigning. He's not running for a new okay. term. Um, and, well, you know, I, and I do, I do uh, buy the, your point that Michel feels very uncomfortable. I, uh, you know, the Syrian regime went to him several times asking him to, you know, support him, support uh, 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 the regime publicly, and he turned them down. And you know, he went and negotiated the reconciliation with uh, uh, with Fatah, and uh, you know, Hamas and Gaza wasn't very happy with this. So there are obviously tensions. Uh, but uh, for me, Mishal deciding not to run for another term um, suggests that he actually lost the battle within within Hamas. Um, and again, you know, there are people who are much better in Palestinian movements than me. That's just my own uh, speculation. Uh, Dina, on the security angle um, and the, the terrorist attacks in in, uh, in Syria, um, I 
we know that Syria has had a long relationship with, uh, with you know, jihadi groups that facilitated their uh, entry into Iraq and Lebanon. Uh, uh, some people may have forgotten mm -hmm. the Fatah al Islam episode. Uh, it was, uh, you know, very clear indications that, that the Syrians were mm -hmm. redirecting fighters. So they always had this very, not so ambiguous relationship with, uh, with, with jihadi groups. Uh, could have some turned against them? Possible. Um, and, uh, you know, but my point here is that on Al Qaeda, it's a very high dimension, to be honest. The Lebanese defense minister made the comments uh, in December that Al Qaeda was present in Aksal and Wadi Khalid. Um, so I was curious. I went up to Aksal and uh, we went up to, to Wadi Khalid. The reality is that these are two tribal areas of Lebanon, they're not Salafis. And if you want to look for Salafis, go to um, uh, go to the Nile. They're not living in Aksal and Wadi Khalid. And the way I can illustrate this is, women in those places don't cover their faces. They work. They go out. You go to, with them. You sit with them at home. Um, you interact with. I mean, just to give you a sense of how different the two. Now, when I went to Aksal, I asked the question: So, are you smuggling? Are you, you know? Uh, weaponry and, and uh, medicines and so on, and medical supplies and people, both ways and so on, they say, oh yes, we're doing all that, but we're not Al-Qaeda. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, and, and I worry that every time we're going to, you know, hear about the fighter or some kind of, we're going to assume it's Al-Qaeda just because it's our own experience. For the moment, we have seen nothing that suggests it's, it's really Al-Qaeda. And they would have issued statements saying, hey, we're back in the game. Uh, you thought that we were down, and that's it. We just bombed the headquarters of Syrian intelligence. And Al-Qaeda is very good at one thing, boasting that it's still alive, right? It hasn't done so in the case of, of, uh, of Syria. Um, is there concern about the spread? Uh, yes, <coughs> but the Gulf states have always also had an ambiguous relationship with, uh, with those groups. Um, I, I suspect that uh, the longer this lasts, the greater the chances of Al-Qaeda really emerging in Syria are. But this is why it's important for this, uh, you know, the cycle of violence to end soon. please. Camille, uh, if, if I could take you back to the Free Syrian Army, uh, if only for a couple of reasons. One is that while the political opposition to Assad seems to have been plateauing in the last couple of months, the military dimension of the conflict is, is consistently on the rise in the Free Syrian Army seems to be playing the lead role in that. Um, two, because it, it could be at some point a, a plausible policy alternative to actually having boots on the ground, whether it be Turkey or NATO or any other force. Uh, three, because in recent conversations with senior European officials and some Arab officials, and your meeting and my meeting with, with Free State Army commanders in Northern Lebanon and otherwise, there still is a great hesitancy to provide any kind of meaningful support for the Free State Army. And, and lastly, perhaps, because more recently there are reports of more conservative Muslim elements, military elements, infiltrating and, and acting up and taking a lead role in Syria. So there might be an interest there for the international community to consolidate the Free Syrian Army and perhaps have them be the lead military force in, in this rather than have rogue elements. So given all these things, what are your thoughts on the Free Syrian Army and so far the, the lack of apparent engagement be it the West or perhaps even the, the, the more Muslim countries with the Free Syrian Army. Yes, I have a couple of questions. I want to go to Alice's question on the, Iran. Uh, we, saw, we saw reports this week of uh, warnings by the Iran's military guard that Syria has a red line. I was wondering how serious you take these warnings and uh, how would Iran do it if they want to support the Syrian regime? Would they do it with his honor? And do you take seriously the reports that the uh, Obama plays a role in the Badani area and uh, that they have a presence in the and the army ground, basically? My second question is concerning Jordan and the touched up on Jordan. Um, there were some reports in the Syrian and France and Lebanon this week that Jordanian intelligence has a like, relationship with the Syrian intelligence and the expansion that I was wondering if you your view of the Jordanian situation, especially if people believe that Jordan is the country that knows Syria most in the region, more than Turkey, more than anybody else. What kind of role do you think Jordan is playing that should play? John? Neil, thank you very much. Um, I want to ask you about the non-obvious capabilities of the Gulf states. I mean, the Gulf states obviously have money, and they can pick up the phone and send emissaries. But with 
Libya under their belt? Are they thinking they have other capabilities? They, they certainly don't have the Iranian capability of running agents and having people on the ground. But what kind of non-self-evident capabilities do you think they're interested in developing? Do you think they have developed that they might apply in the Syrian context? Thanks. Um, Firas, um, well, your points on the FSA are all well taken. I would agree with before you, you made. Um, the FSA for the moment is still not a unified, consolidated um, organization. Um, they, they endorse a lot of attacks uh, after the fact to actually uh, project uh, more um, power than they have uh, to be taken as a serious political actor to constrain uh, the SNC and so on. What's, what's very clear to me is that the popularity of the SS FSA has grown enormously among activists. Um, and, uh, you know, you meet a lot of activists who disparage uh, the NCC, less but still a significant group that, you know, don't really trust the SNC, they feel the SNC is a bit all over the place. Um, but the FSA are heroes. Uh, they, you know, first because they live on the same very difficult conditions, they're not, you know, in Western or Arab capital, so they feel that they get it. Um, the second element is that um, they, uh, uh, the FSA is uh, is really building on existing networks inside inside Syria. So they you know they they, um, they ally with with local groups with with local tribes and, and so on. So they're more part of the fabric uh, of, of the country. Now the problem for the FSA is that if it wants to get any foreign support. Um, they have to explain what the chain of command is. They have to explain what their political vision is. Um, if the FSA is serious about being a professional rebel army, uh, rather a ragtag uh, uh, group, um, they have to maintain internal discipline. Uh, they have to be sure, uh, be careful not to be penetrated by, by regime informants. I mean, there's a very troubling recent episode um, about a, a senior uh, uh, a senior defector who all the FSA uh, people are telling us he's an informant, um, and you know he managed to spend a few weeks and uh, uh, with with the regime, and then uh, I have no evidence to confirm. Uh, not not with the regime, with the factor. I have no way to confirm or not uh, the story. It's just it's, it's, um, hearing it through the, through the grapevine. Um, what I'm trying to say is, for me, the FSA is not yet a credible actor as it is. Yes, it does have. Uh, um, the support of the street, it's very emotional, they're here, they see real achievements on the ground. If you go to Zabadani and you say negative things about the FSA, today I suspect you're going to be lynched. Um, but the point is that if they don't solidify their chain of command and if they don't uh, really coordinate politically with the SNC um, or whatever new umbrella, uh, opposition umbrella group there is, um, they're not going to be able to uh, become a more viable force. The other thing with, with the FSA is that um, most of the defectors come with their own uh, uh, weaponry and their own ammunition, but they still don't have access to heavy weaponry, to mechanized uh, assets. They're not able to hold on to key infrastructure points for a very long time. Uh, and if and without a no-fly zone, they would be very visible and vulnerable from the air or elsewhere. So they have to be very careful about how they encourage defectors. I heard from FSA uh, commanders that they discourage defectors today because they don't no longer want people who come with only a, a, a gun and, and bullets. Um, um, and they have to feed them, they have to, you know, there's a whole support network for, for these people and their capabilities are not there yet. So they actually actively ask some people not to defect for better days, you know, if there is a uh, no-fly zone and, and so on. Um, will the FSA emerge as a policy uh, alternative? Um, yes, I think, uh, you know, time will only, uh, uh, I mean, time will only help the FSA become this more cohesive, coherent uh, group. Um, in terms of foreign support, I think the West will be always very uh, cautious, and I think the Libya uh, example is a, is a better uh, is a better one, where actually you rely on the Gulf states to you know, provide, and, you know, buy the equipment, ship it, and, and so on, some of the assistance. I don't think we'll see French special troops or, or British special troops deployed in, in Syria the way we, we saw in, in Libya. 
um, as advisors and so on, uh, the Gulf states can play that role. Um, and I suspect they're already thinking about it. Um, Amal, your um, Iranian support for, for the Syrian regime. Well, you know, there was a very interesting story in the Wall Street Journal uh, a few days ago about how Iran is helping Syria export and sell its oil. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, that's one way, you know, the financial lifeline um, is, uh, for Assad is, is extremely important. And if it goes through Iran, then his dependency on Iran only increases. Um, but Iran has been helping uh, Syria in other ways. Um, I, I suspect that uh, the Syria's ability to dismantle some of the uh, networks of activists uh, that were key in the mobilization in the first few months was because of Iranian expertise after Iran's own uprising in 2009. And Iran has been very good in 2009 at identifying and targeting uh, the key activists, either jailing them and forcing them to, uh, or forcing them to go into hiding or to actually go to Turkey or other places. In a way, that's how the Green Movement lost its uh, you know, um, ability to uh, organize massive demonstrations and so on. And that's what's so interesting in Syria is that the first three, four months, we saw you know, uh, growing demonstrations and so on. But then key uh, activists uh, uh, key, uh, um, uh, just disappeared from, from the radar. And I think that's largely because uh, Iran helped uh, the Syrians with network analysis and uh, uh, internet and IT monitoring and, and things like that. The final thing I've heard about, uh, about Iranian support is, uh, you know, the role of Colonel Saad uh, snipers. Um, that somehow Iran is actually providing very uh, specific technical help um, to, to the Syrian military and security forces, uh, not, you know, flooding them with weaponry that the Syrians already have manpower and, 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 and weaponry, just developing some capabilities here and there. Um, I don't believe uh, uh, reports that say that there are Hezbollah or, or Iranian elements on the ground. I think the Syrians have this expertise. Um, they've done it in the past. Um, this military was uh, designed uh, for regime security more than fighting Israel or anything else. I don't think that the, the issue of manpower is over, has, be, has uh, become a huge problem for the regime yet. Further down the road, possible. But at this point, I, I'm very skeptical. So I'm not sure I believe those reports in the Balani. On Jordan, I couldn't say, honestly, about uh, the relationship between Syrian and Jordanian uh, intelligence. Um, but if I were working on Abdullah or even the Jordanian intelligence services, I'd be listening to the Gulf states much more than, uh, you know, I did my survival, my you know stability, my well-being depend a lot more on the Gulf states than, than Syria. So if part of the Jordanian intelligence services are playing that game, that would be very destructive. And finally, John, on the, on the, on the Gulf states' innovative ways uh, to operate in, uh, in Syria. I'm, I'm sure the Gulf states have already talked to uh, you know, a couple of Libyan commanders uh, looking for a cause. Uh, you know, we heard about uh, Belhaj uh, uh, you know, already approaching Syrians. Uh, we, we talked to Syrians who have been approaching the approach by them. Um, I, uh, I think this is a very dangerous course um, uh, because that would, in a way, confirm uh, or validate the, the, regime, the Assad regime's narrative that there is a jihadi foreign element to that. I mean, none of us would count Bel Hajj as one of the most liberal, unlighted uh, fighters you know, in the Libyan uprising. Uh, so we, we would all cringe, Western states would cringe, um, and, and if it comes too early in the process, it could disrupt any kind of support for, uh, uh, for the Syrian opposition or plans to uh, or disrupt plans for intervention. I suspect that uh, the Turks themselves are not very keen uh, going down this road. Um, the Turks are very concerned about the sectarian dimension of the uprising for domestic reasons. Uh, but also because it, uh, it uh, creates uh, real issues with Iran and Iraq. I mean, if you look at the current uh, uh, rhetoric uh, of Maliki against Erdogan, it's pretty amazing. And, and, and Turkey cannot afford to have uh, bad relations with, I mean, having operations into Syria, bad relations with the Iraqi government and the Iranian government, and have the Russians uh, very unhappy and wondering what they're doing. So, I mean, that discussion needs to happen between the Gulf states, Turkey, and 
and the West before the Gulf states was centralized. Now that said, you may have got individuals wanting to go down this road and actually do it, you know, being freelancers. And that's what I really worry about, not the Gulf states saying, we'll find every scary uh, jihadi we can and we'll send him to, to Syria. I, I think they will think a lot more um, about this before going down this road. I worry about uh, Syrian indivi individuals, uh, uh, Gulf individuals, considering this just because they buy in the, in the struggle. Well, although we have uh, exhausted neither the subject nor Emil's knowledge of the subject, uh, our time is drawn to a close. Emil, thank you for that presentation.